thank you for the invitation to be here. It's a, a really an honor. Uh, I mean, Godel was one of the founders of uh, Theory of Computing, and also it's another honor uh, to be in a short list that start with uh, Donald Knuth, for me the most important person in Algorands. So, um, what is the talk about? Okay. This is an easy case. It's very easy to prove that Kurt Godel didn't say this because the internet is much later. But the problem is worse. So uh, in the last uh, presidential elections in the US, there were many fake news. Here in this article in BuzzFeed News, you can find the top 50, but there are thousands of fake news. So you can imagine how easy it is to manipulate people with news that people want to believe. And we are all like that. I think Austria is much better on this, but quoting uh, a former prime minister of England, it says there are three kinds of lies. Lies, dumb lies, and statistics. Hmm? Uh, I think a much better description of this is a famous joke about a statistician that has the legs in the freezer and the head in the oven, and the oven is on. And someone asks, how do you feel? Oh, on average, I'm fine. <laughs> so, but he was almost near to death. So I found one case for Austria, and I think you had it last year, when there was a fake news about the medical condition of the current president. Well, he had to show the medical records, which is something you don't expect a candidate to show, although some other candidates don't show tax returns. So doesn't matter. And what is the problem? The problem is that, and this is just one example, but there are many, we all have biases. Biases, they are not, they are not wrong by definition. Biases are what sustain our beliefs, what is right and what is wrong. So they are okay. But the problem is when you deviate too much from whatever we say is okay. And that's the first problem that we need to solve. What is okay? What is normal? So normal could be decided by democracy. If most people believe that climate change doesn't exist, maybe that's the truth, okay? They will never see if that, that's true or not, but our generation's past will see it. So bias, in statistical terms, is any significant deviation from a, from a prior distribution. Sometimes the distribution is unknown, and that's one problem. So for example, here, I'm trying to estimate how many females are in the audience. So if it's more than 20%, I may say this is a positive gender bias, because in technical talks, usually that number is like 15%. Of course, if we take the distribution of society, we have a negative bias, because in society, about 50% are women. So this is very important, what you take as the base distribution for comparison. So this is the definition of bias. This is what I want to talk about. And when you take human data, human data, for example, collected through the web, how we interact with the web, you will find many biases. I will not read this list. This is just a list of the ones that could be important. There are other problems, like how you measure things, if they are valid or not. Completeness, we just heard about Godel and completeness, how we gather the data and so on. And I started to worry about this problem uh, about more than a year ago. And one problem was that many people take data, analyze people using that data, and then extrapolate the results to all the rest of the world. And that statistically is wrong. So the typical case, Twitter data. How many elections have been predicted wrong 
with Twitter data. Why? Because Twitter users, first, are technologically biased. Second, are economically biased. You need to have a smartphone and access to internet. Educationally biased, most of them went to the university. They should be smarter, I'm not sure. Maybe they're politically biased in the US. In the US, for example, they're geographically biased. East, West Coast, maybe in Austria, most of them are in Vienna, and so on. And I keep going. During the Obama government, there was a lot of work on data bias that affect minorities, especially gender bias, racial bias, and they produced a couple of reports that are very interesting that were in the White House website until recently. Okay, but they are archived so you can find them. And it's about how important it is to have the right data to be able to take a decision, automatic decision, maybe with a machine learning algorithm, that respect the fairness of that decision. For example, that a person with a different race or different religion is not uh, treated wrongly. And that's very important. However, there are other biases that are not so easy to see that affect all of us. And this is what this might talk about. It's not about a bias that will affect a minority. It's a bias that will affect all of us. It's not mainly in the data. It's more on the process, on how systems are produced and how we use them. Partly it's our fault, but partly it's also the system's fault. So the goal of this talk is be aware of this. So be aware of this danger, and maybe next time you will do things differently. So what is the technical, non-technical question? You have an algorithm that is the core of the system. You have biased data as input. And then we said, should the algorithm be neutral or be fair? Well, if you take biased data and you don't do anything, the output will be biased. And this is the main worry of research in the last two, three years. However, what is fair? What is neutral? What is the bias? So for example, we can start working on how to measure that bias. So the answer is complicated. Not always you need to do something. Like whenever we have a very hard decision, maybe sometimes we need to let the system be neutral in the sense that don't do anything. But if you want to be fair, you want to make sure that the system is taking the right bias and not putting their own bias inside it. There are many solutions to this problem. You can debias the data. You can tune the algorithm to understand the bias. You can debias the output. A lot of people are working on this. But the problem is not only on the process with the data, it's on the process itself that creates the data. For example, our interaction with the web. Why is this important? Well, this is important because we are using a lot of machine learning algorithms. Algorithms that learn from data. Maybe you remember uh, last year when we had, you had this uh, Microsoft bot in Twitter that very fast learned how to do hate speech. OK, yeah, we didn't know that he shouldn't learn from some people, that he shouldn't learn bad words. But the bot didn't have any parents to tell that that was wrong. And that's important because when we do machine learning, we've, sometimes we do too many assumptions. For example, we never think about how the properties of the data are distributed. So it's like, if this machine learning algorithm works well in this part of the data, it should work well in this part of the data. And that's always not true. By Murphy's law, it will not be true. The same with error. OK, we have a 95% accuracy machine learning algorithm. And it looks very good. We compute the error, and we find that the average is 2%. Uh, looks even better. 
but nobody cared that in the region that we're using the algorithm, the error was 20%, because the error is not uniform, uh, for sure. Again, by Murphy's Law. And I respect Murphy very well. I had an example with him yesterday, for people that know. Data sampling. Are we using the right data, the right amount of data, the right sample? So how many people that take a sample take 20 samples and compare them? Uh, how many people want to raise their hand? It's like obsessive with sampling. Yeah? Some people say, OK, I took a random sample. It should be fine. Hmm? All the polls, election polls do that, and you see the results. So before to start, how big is the web? This is something that computer scientists should know by heart. It's like asking the population of the world, and most people don't know. So according to the last survey in Netcraft, and this is just an approximation, there were almost 2 billion host names. So for every four people in the world, we have a host name. Yeah. It's a bit of exaggeration, but that's the truth. Active sites, 170 million. And notice this, this is a logarithmic graph, so it looks like the web is still growing exponentially. But that's just an illusion. If we look at the linear graph, you see that the web followed all the economical crisis, maybe even predicted but it's a bit slow in prediction. And how many pages? Well, most pages in the web are dynamic, and you can go to a calendar site and generate all the months of the future, all the months of the past, using an algorithm, and then you can generate infinitely many pages. They are useless, but they are infinite. So let's start. So we'll do a full cycle on the web, so we'll cover this diagram in the way. So let's start with the web itself. And of course, the first bias there is data bias. Let me give you some examples. We have economic bias. This is a graph from a study we did in 2005 of the web of Spain. It's the largest study so far done in a web of a country. And this is a comparison of exports of Spain to all the countries in the world and the links of the web of Spain to those countries. Correlation is larger than 0.8. Okay? It's hard to prove causality, but you think that you will believe that in a touristic country there's a large correlation between these two things. You see that Denmark and the United Kingdom are in the top, France, Italy, so a lot of interchange, but also a lot of tourism. Hmm? Well, there are some outliers. We can take this out, and the correlation will improve. Why we can take this out? Well, because TK is a very small country. How those many links? FM, do you know it's another country? But it's used for radio. So all these are countries that sold their right to use the internet domain to companies, and really they are not countries in the internet domain. So we can get rid of that. If you're wondering, most of these countries are in the same continent. So you can do your homework later. Do you find this in all countries? So here we try five, because we had the data for these five. United Kingdom, Spain, Greece, Brazil, and Chile. More developed the country, larger the correlation. Not only for exports, also for imports. So the link structure of the web is biased by the economy of the world. There are some cultural bias. So these are the distribution of page sizes in websites. And here I have four countries. They are similar. Korea is South Korea. This was an American published paper. I have an American author, so I should have written South Korea, but it didn't happen. So what you have in the rightmost side of the distribution is the classical power law, the SIP law, the law of minimal effort. People don't do big pages because it's too much work. And sure, also at the end of these lines, 
All these pages are not done by people, are done by, pro by programs, right? However, you see that at the beginning, the distribution is not the same. And it's the same in every country, so it's, it's something that is beyond culture. It's something also human. So I named this law, and I call it the shame law. Hmm? Basically, it's like when you want to approve a course. You don't have to approve it, but also you do enough to approve it. <laughs> like you write the page, you do enough work until you feel like you have a reasonable page and you show enough work. But you don't want to do more work than enough. And this is very interesting because what it changes for every culture is this crossing point between the shame law and the minimal effort law. And of course, some countries uh, work more than others. You can make your own conclusions later. And this can be seen in many distributions. This one, is, for example, is about the number of images. So here you can learn that Brazilians like more images than Chile. Uh, Greece is in the middle. Korea also likes a lot of images and very colorful. And Spain is the one that likes less images. And again, we have these two distributions. What about content? Well, content, there are many biases, but one is linguistic. So this is a study from Language Connect for the one million top websites. No idea how they define what the top one million. Probably it's wrong, but doesn't matter. It's around right. So English is about half of the web on the top websites. Of course, this is different from the top 25 world languages where English is third, or the top 10 languages in the internet where English is first, but it's not 50%. Or even the language on the web where English is first, but it's 27% and not 50%. So there's a huge linguistic bias on the top sources on the web. And that affects a lot of people. Why? Because most people in the world cannot read English. And this is the best data. The best Wikipedia is the English Wikipedia. What about geographical bias? This is one of, one of the work of my PhD students, Eduardo, and it's about news. And it's in Chile. But I'm sure Chile is like Austria. A large percentage of the population lives in the capital. So most news are generated in the capital. If you do a recommendation systems on news, most news will come from the center of political power. And you can see there. So the first big chunk is the metropolitan region, which is where the capital of Chile, Santiago, is. And you see that the Patagonia is one of the very thin lines on this graph of reading news and generating news. So the solution for geographical bias is simple. If you can know the location of the person, you give news from that region. Say, if you are in Innsbruck, you need to read also news from Tirol. And I didn't learn this for the talk. I know it from when I was a kid because geography is my hobby. So. And this was the first place I visited in Austria, Innsbruck, about exactly, wow, uh, 40 years ago. Too long. So the interesting part of the study is an analysis of how people read news and what they prefer. And he showed in a real system that most people prefer the version with local news. Of course, we didn't ask this. We just saw the interaction, and we analyzed the interaction, and we got the data, and the data showed that local news were important to people. So you need to show some local news. And here, the size of every news depends on the location and the importance. So these are three examples on the content. But the best example is about gender bias. This is a study last year of uh, Microsoft Research and one person in Boston University looking at word embeddings in male-female analogies. And from the news, they got these analogies. So these are the ones that are right, only the last two lines. If you're a queen, he's a king. If you're a mother, he's a father. But if you are a 
surgeon, she's a nurse. Okay? Or if he's a superstar, she's a diva. Okay? Not so good. Huh? If she's a housewife, she's a shopkeeper, and so on. So this is mostly because, I guess, males are writing the news. So you can say, well, this is standard gender bias. Well, I did a bit more research, and this were news from the US, and I found out that about 70% of the main journalists in the US are men. So no wonder you will have bias. But something more astonishing is that I found out with that research that at university, the proportion is the opposite. About 70% are women when they study. So here we have a much bigger bias. A woman to be journalist in the US needs like double the quality <laughs> to get a position. And another example from Eduardo's thesis, and this is from Wikipedia, another example of gender bias. This line is the proportion of women biographies in Wikipedia, and they are sorted by time. So you see that the lowest point in time of biography for women was around the French Revolution. I'm not a historian to see if there's some relation, but it's interesting. And then we have been going up all the way to 24%, but still far away from 50%. So you can say, well, this is the reflection of gender bias in history. And this will be a reasonable explanation, but it's wrong. There is a much stronger bias here. Will be obvious after I tell you. Hmm? as all obvious things. So most people that write in Wikipedia are men. Hmm? Not all people that say they are gender, but the people that do, the majority by far is men, 90%. Now, for people, only 10.7% of the editors are women. So no wonder you have a problem with gender bias there. So please, women, write more about women. Okay, become Wikipedia editors, change this. On the other hand, if we compare with the Wikipedia editors, we have a positive bias, because the average category has 9% women, and these biographies have 10.7%. So this will be a positive bias. Now, there's a more deeper question is, do women in the world have the same opportunity to become a Wikipedia editor? How many women have access to internet? Uh, that's outside my field of research, but I think they're interesting question for a sociologist. Okay, that's enough about content. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Everything has some bias. The second bias that is important in this process is what I call activity bias. It's about you. Okay? So how many people here like to put comments in Facebook? Okay, that's standard. Huh? Most people in the world just watch. Huh? This is activity bias. Some write, some just read. And the problem is that then the ones that write make a decision, right? With another PhD student, Diego, we look at the following problem. Which percent of users produce 50% of the content? Like democracy. How many people say this is my view of the world and produce 50% of the content? And we took four data sets. A small one from Facebook, a middle size from Amazon reviews that is public, Almost all Twitter from 2011 that we got uh, access to analyze this, and then the whole Wikipedia, because they have very good statistics. And these are sorted from less bias to more bias. So in this small data set from Facebook about uh, New Orleans in 2009, 7% of the people put 50% of the posts. 
Okay? So 7% of the people produce 50% of the posts. Amazon reviews. 4% of the people wrote half of the reviews. This was in 2015. When I saw this, I said this is impossible. Cannot be that 4% of the people is writing for free half of the reviews. Well, in October of 2015, Amazon proved me right one month after the paper and started to sue a lot of fake reviewers that were writing good reviews for money. And they continued this crusade last year in 2016. And that's a problem. How do you recognize good reviews from fake reviews? They are very hard because the fake reviews are the most well written. <laughs> That they are being paid. And we, f we, we look at this more in detail, and we found that the 4% was down to 2.5% if you count only the good reviews. And most of them are fake. So, and here you see is the entropy of the text and the usefulness of the review. The problem is that people don't know that most of these reviews were fake, so they find it useful, although it's a lie. You know, some lies are useful. Depends if you want to believe them. So let's go back to, to this. Twitter. This was almost all Twitter data until 2011. 2% 2 of the users generated half of the tweets. Here, the explanation is easy. It's called ego. <laughs> and we know that. However, it's uh, really, uh, I don't know, worrisome that it's so hard. Wikipedia, even more bias. 0.04%. 2,000 people wrote half of the first entry of the English Wikipedia. This is a good bias. Thanks to, thanks to these, these people that were paid, we have Wikipedia. They did the snowball big enough to make the ball rolling, and other people do this. So this is a good bias, the last one. The others are just about human. So this is activity bias. You see, activity bias at work. Only a small fraction of people are active, interact with the system. And that's one problem. There is no wisdom of crowds if only 2% of the people interact with the system, right? It's the opposite. It's the tyranny of the minority. And that is happening in many ways. I had another question, which I call the digital desert. Digital desert is the content in the web that no one ever sees. So how many of the websites that were there, of the one billion websites, do you know? Hmm? How many have never been visited because they are not linked? They cannot be found in a search engine. So we found a lower bound and an upper bound. The upper bound is that 31% of the articles that have been added or changed in Wikipedia in a month, no one sees them in the next month. That's an upper bound. We could look at the longer time, but this was enough to, to see that there's a lot of content that no one sees in a segment of time. The lower bound, 1.1% of the tweets are generated by people that don't have any followers. Okay? I don't know if these people understand how Twitter works, <laughs> but it's like going to the, the Sahara Desert and scream. You can scream as much as you want. No one will hear you, but maybe it's a cathartic experience that will help you. So that's activity bias. So if you want to be on the wisdom, do something. If you just watch, if you don't vote, don't complain later, right? You didn't exercise your rights. Okay, so this is about the data, that's about us, and now we have Machines, systems, algorithms. So the first problem, sampling bias. We want to solve a problem using data from the web. 
we use a sample because the web is too large, and then we are uh, thinking that the sample is okay. However, it's not. So if you take the standard uh, error formula for binomial, which is the square root of 1 minus p over np, this is the relative error, not the absolute error, the relative error, then that formula works very well for p equals 1 half. A statistics books are obsessed with p equals 1 half. If you have studied statistics, everything is about 1 half. Why? Because that's the most difficult case for the uniform distribution. What do we learn in reality? That nothing f follows the uniform distribution, even less in the web. In the web, we work with p almost zero. Probability of a click, one in 10,000. Probability of a click in an ad, one in 100,000. Thanks to that, we have free internet, thanks to those clicks. So you need to use something very different. For example, here you see the standard interval, and you see that near zero is really bad. Basically, diverges there. So you cannot use the standard. This one is much better. It's called the Agresti Coley interval, and this one works very well near zero. You see, near zero is even better than for one half. So next time you want to compute the size of the sample, please use this. Let me give you an example. If I want to see an event that happens 10% of the time, I want to use confidence interval 90%, and I want to have a relative error of 10%, so basically between 0 0.09 and 0.11, and this is a very large probability for the web, this is a very low confidence interval, and it's a very large relative error. If we use the standard formula, you get that you need to take 900 samples. Let's say a dice. Well, the real number is over 2,000. So what will happen if you do wrong size? You take 900, you don't see the event, and then you infer that the event doesn't exist or has a very low probability. Mm, wrong, you had the wrong sample. And the same with distribution. So this was from a paper that we wrote in 2010 about power loss. So I will not go over the formula, but this is basically this is a standard way to sample distributions. Even if you use the standard way, for some very biased distribution, the result is completely wrong. For example, here you see a power law. This is a log-log graph. And here you see a small sample of 1,000 elements. Doesn't resemble the right distribution. So you need to do better ways to sample. And one possibility is using a variation of a stratified sampling that basically you divide the elements in different groups and then you sample for each group. So here you have a real example. This is a, a collection of 130,000 elements with a frequency and this is a sample of just 130 elements, so 0.1% that have exactly the same distribution of the real distribution. So this you can say, my sample is a mirror of the regional distribution. But if you don't do this, you will get this problem of here. You will get something that's not a power law, and here you will give more importance to the head than to the tail distribution, and you know, tails are very important in power laws. Okay, so this is about sampling. But we can have bias that also are added by the algorithm. And the main ones are in the interaction. I will cover them next, but let me give you one example of something that looks completely right and is completely wrong from the computer science point of view. So let's say you have a system where you upload pictures you can write two tags, like London Eye and Thames, and then a system suggests other tags using co-occurrence of tags by what other people have done. So he suggests, the system suggests all these tags, and then you click in the ones that are right. 
Today, with deep learning, the system can do it without you giving any tax, right? They can infer a lot of things. However, what is the problem here? The problem here is that people will use it. And next time, you will put one tag. And you see that works fine. So next time, you don't put any tags. Let the system work. In a few months, no humans, by the law of minimal effort, have written any tag at all. But the system cannot learn anything new without tags. So this is like a very slow harakiri. The algorithm is killing itself because it's not learning anything new because there's no new data. Why this is folksonomy? The only way that you learn from a folksonomy is that tax comes from people. And if no one reads right tax, there's no new knowledge. So if you have a folksonomy, please don't mess with it. Don't put machines in between. Uh, delicious did that, if you remember what was delicious. And what is now? You, you don't even know it. So if you have a system that depends on human knowledge, we have to live with the law of minimal effort. However, I can reuse the system of tax to search, because I can expand the query with tags that I suggest, and then search can be much better. But it's not about helping people, it's about helping the system. So don't do this. So sometimes computer scientists do things that are look great without knowing what they are doing. And I, I'm between them. So interaction bias. This is the main problem. This algorithm will interact with people through a screen. So this line is a screen. OK? And the people there, they have their own self-selection bias. So interaction bias is depends on what the system chose to you and also what you like from the system, and that changes with every person. Privacy is important here, but I think I will not be able to cover that. And let me show you some examples. So I'm sure you recognize that page, and just in case I put the domain to have the right attribution, but we all know this page. So what are the biases here? The first one is presentation bias. I'm sure that anything in this page may get some click, and I'm sure that anything that's not in, in this page will don't get any clicks, right? That's presentation bias. So for example, if you go to supermarket, true competition will be that you go to buy a winner, and you have all possible brands of winner there. That never happens. There's something going on between brands and supermarkets but you never have the whole uh, space for winners to choose from. In the internet, in the web, it's worse. For example, maybe you have 10 movies that are recommended, and there are 10 million behind that. You will never see the one that you want to see. Second, position bias. In Western culture, in most Western culture, we read from top to bottom and from left to right. So most people look first to the top left corner. And most people never look at the bottom right corner. They read very fast in diagonal down and so on. More important, if you have a list of elements ordered by rank, like in a search engine, people look first at the number one, number two, number three. Some people look at number 10. And most people never look at whatever is next. They don't say the next 10. I'm still looking for the engineer in the first search engine that decided that we, show, we need to show 10 links. Okay? Must be an engineer, because 10 doesn't have any reason, re relation to the size of the screen or any other attribute. What was the first search engine? This is a like, basic history of computer science. First search engine. OK, homework. This is not the one that you're thinking. Social bias. Let's say I want to buy these tennis balls. And instead of looking at five stars, I'm looking at three stars. Maybe I will not buy them. 
doesn't matter how cheap they are. So the rest of the people is biasing my decision. Hmm? Well, I will get back to that. Interaction bias, anything else? For example, some people don't know that you can scroll the page and then they will never click on something below that line. I'm not joking. I mean, we are not normal users. <laughs> Huh? And you can put this in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a graph, so these bias cascade, so they are not alone, so it's even harder to measure. You need to do a lot of A-B testing to be able to see what is the relation between them. Some of them are from the system, some of them are from you. Self-selection bias. Some people are eager to click, they need to click. Some people read moving the mouse. They cannot read without moving the mouse. These are the more hyperactive people. They need to be doing something. Huh? And this affects the interaction. Social bias. This is interesting work uh, a bit more than two years ago done in IBM research. And they showed you, they showed that basically these fake reviews in Amazon change the rates of products. So the number of stars makes, makes a difference. Here you see an injection of 50 artificial five-star ratings. The red product that already started with some fake reviews keeps being better than the blue one that was not smart enough to pay people to do this. And the same are more or less intrinsically the same. So these are the intrinsic values and the rest is social bias. So social bias can be a big problem in that. So if you see a small number of reviews and they're very good, surely these are fake. Here is a sample of position bias. How things have changed between 2005 2014. Both are in Google, are using eye tracking, and people are looking at different things. This was only text. Now with universal search, people look at other things because people look to, like, to look at images and video. So that's the only thing that can change our focus on the top left corner. Even some people look at advertising on the right. Hmm? So if you put this in a graph, you see this. So this is a typical distribution of clicks in search engines. You see that a huge percentage on the number one. Well, it's not only bias, it's also navigational queries. Minimal effort, again. How many people write HTTP colon slash slash Facebook.com? None. They say Facebook search, faster. And then they click in the first result. So these are navigational queries. In desktop, it's about 25%. So you can take the 25%, but still you will be here. You will be in 20%. So 20% is it's still a lot. So this is position bias. This is interaction bias. Most people are too lazy to go to the next page. They are satisfied with the first one. Doesn't matter what the search engine chose to them. It's, I think it's completely independent of quality. Huh? And then if you have the real system, what you see in a log log graph is something like this, but what you really should have seen is this. And there's some work on how to de-bias clicks. Both papers are from Yahoo Labs at that time. And there's not much else public about how the bias input from coming from people. So basically, de-biasing means what will be the order or the clicks if the order was random. Uh, good things, in the last Wisdom Conference, the best paper was learning to rank with bias. This is the one con very interesting contribution to dealing with bias in search. But there are many other problems like recommended system where we don't have the same. Okay, the last one, the most dangerous one. This is the work of the system and you. I call it the second order bias. It's basically how your actions are going back to the system and going back to the web. So let's, I will start with the one going back to the system. 
how your interaction changes the system. Why? Because we're using machine learning. We're learning from you. And the best example is the filter bubble. Personalization. Uh, this is a very interesting book. That's already six years old. And it's about learning from the user and trying to predict what the user wants. For example, let's say I, I, I have known Stefan from childhood, and I know everything about him. So every time he comes to work, he sees a screen with exactly the screen he wanted to see that morning. That would be scary, right? It's like reading your mind. Oh, here is the mail you have to send. Here is the article you, you have to keep writing, and so on. What is the problem with that? It looks very nice. The problem is that I will never be able to show him something new that if he knew it, he would like it. Why? Because I, have, I don't have no data for that. The best way to understand this is with the Truman Show. I guess most of here saw the movie. This person was happy until learned that he was living in a bubble. Why? Because he couldn't see the rest of the world. We need to see the rest of the world, even when we don't want to see it. We need to see it. Otherwise, we get to extremes. What are the solutions? Solution is diversity. Put other points of view. Novelty. New things. Serendipity. Surprise me. The one that I want. Show me the dark side. Show me what a person completely different from me would like to see. Maybe it's scary, but I want to be aware of it. Some people don't, but I want to be aware of it. I haven't seen this yet, but I think it would be very interesting to see what's on the other extreme of the, your bubble. Okay? And the other extreme of your bubble is very close. It's, in, it's here in Vienna. It's not in China. It's the person that has your opposite beliefs. One problem, and has to do with presentation bias too, what do we do with new things? How we learn from things we haven't seen before? So we need to do something called explore. We need to show them to some people. We need to learn from the clicks. And then you exploit that information. However, one problem in internet systems is to, that explore means wasting money. Means, for example, no clicks. So less revenue. And then. Internet companies have trouble to do that because they need to waste money on things that they may be earning. But it's the only way to learn from in the future. So long term, you need to explore to learn about your data. Otherwise, you will fool yourself and have like a self-fulfilled prophecy and things will collapse. And some e-commerce sites have had that problem. So one research problem, how much exploration is needed for Presentation bias. How much time I need to show a, a strange item to make sure that I know how good it is or how many people will like it? I haven't seen a formal paper on that. So one related topic is the tail. So a strange items are in the tail. How we take care of the tail? How we aggregate in the tail? Because we don't have enough data from people, for example, that never interact. For all the watchers, it's very hard to predict things. So instead of trying to personalize, so instead of trying to create a filter bubble for you, it's much better to predict the intention, and this is what we are doing in intent, predict the intention of what you want to search, and then take all the people that in the past have searched about that, for example, I say attractions in Vienna, let's take all the people that ask for things about Vienna and all the clicks, and that's much more data than any personal data. Because at the end, it's not about you. It's not about personalization, my question. It's about knowledge, and more people will know more. So this is the wisdom of an ad hoc crowd that is built from the data of the people that is like you in this same context. We all are very similar in the same context. So we want to do the same kind of things. So this is what I call 
contextualization, which is a kind of personalization, but I want to, to reinforce that it's the context that matters, it's not the person. Let me give you an example. And this was another work at Yahoo Labs. Let's take all geolocated pictures. This was done in Flickr. We take the photo streams of every person. We map them to point of interest in the city, and we get time pass in the city. Let's say these are point of interest in Vienna, and this is one tourist. Went to six places. This is another tourist. Went to three places, and so on. And now, if I'm in a city, I will pick my favorite city, Barcelona, and I say I have two hours, what should I do? Well, you take all these collections of people that went to Barcelona and say, okay, if your starting point is uh, Plaza Catalunya, then look at the plaza, then go to the cathedral, then go to the market in Las Ramblas, the Boqueria market, and then because you told me that you have to go to the airport next, you go to Plaza España and see the Venetian Towers and the National Museum, and then you go to the airport, otherwise you will lose the plane. Hmm? I have an obsession of losing planes. So we can tell you how much time you have to be in any place. We can tell you how much time you will take from place to place because all geolocated pictures have their time. We can even tell you how many pictures you have to take. But that's over-personalization, don't do that. That's uh, something that you have to choose. So this is, this is the ad, ad hoc crowd. All the people that have been in Barcelona help the new people coming to Barcelona. And you can do this in every city in the world. And the last example of second order bias in web content. So let's say you are writing uh, your new blog entry in the web or you're just writing a piece of text that you want to publish in the web. So you do a query in a search engine to get some inspiration. You choose three pages from the top 10 because you don't go to the next page. Let's say these are pages one, three, and six. One problem is that web content is redundant. It's about 20%. And I already told you, this list may be biased. Okay, but that's a matter. I don't realize that. There's some work showing that maybe this is not a problem. So this was 2006, maybe it's fine. It, it compensates itself. So you keep, without knowing all this, you keep ahead and you take your new page. You select three pieces of content this is a typical mashup article. You put it in the right place to make sense, right? Because you are not doing plagiarism, you put quotes on the source with the link because you are a good researcher. But then you feel shame, the shame law. You haven't written anything. So you put some writing from you, so it makes like a reasonable sense. Oh, very important, you put your name. <laughs> okay, it's your article. And now you publish it in the web. Hmm? This happens every day. I don't know how many times. I don't want to know. Too many times. What's the problem? The problem is that this content is biased on what this search engine thinks is important. Not only the ranking, but the way that they rank. So your content is tainted by what other people think is better, and these people is a machine. It's an algorithm. And we showed in a paper in 2008 that this goes to more than 35% semantic repetition. So this is the most, I think, complicated problem to solve. We are reinforcing the bias every time we don't do any independent work. So next time, please write the entry alone. Cut the internet connection. Uh, go to a park. Switch off your phone. Write it. Uh, now, to finish, uh, don't take me wrong, bias is not always bad. Thanks to bias, the web works. Thanks to activity bias, 
the web works. Power laws are good. Few people doing things, that's good. Caching works. Uh, content caching, essential web pages, e-commerce, everything works thanks to bias. Activity bias, self-selection bias. So these are the messages. The web is an amplifier of our society. It's the best mirror we have, the wrong and the right, but also it's traceable. This is an advantage. We can trace how it has been done. And this is good because we can trace the bad things. But we need to be aware of your own bias, be aware of this cycle, vicious cycle of bias. We need to be aware of our privacy. I didn't talk about that, but that's another problem. And I'm really worried when we have a lot of sensors, the Internet of Things, together with us. Why? Because sensors don't have any activity bias. They can generate data crazy, even wrong data crazy. So I don't know what will happen. And to finish, and why this is even more difficult than, than the problem I'm, I'm talking, is a very nice example on data science. And I will call it professional bias. It's again back to you. Uh, in the center of open science in Virginia, they took all the uh, historical data about the red cars in the Champions League. And here we are not in the US, I don't need to explain what is the Champions League, right? <laughs> so they took all the red cards history of Champions League and they asked to a lot of people, do black players get more red cards than white players, yes or no? Okay? And they had 29 teams of 61 data scientists, 20 said yes, the hypothesis is correct, nine said no, it's not correct. But the interesting thing was not this disagreement that it doesn't surprise me, is that no team did the same. So the 29 teams found this average, the zero is the equally likely hypothesis. Some people computed the confidence interval and then could improve the hypothesis, on, although they were above the line. Some people didn't care about the confidence interval. Some people computed and had huge confidence interval, so something wrong in the analysis. So next time that you have a very important problem to solve, split your data scientists in three, ask three groups to find the solution, they will get, come back with three different answers for sure, and then you put all of them in a room until they agree. Okay? <laughs> uh, bad news, maybe the answer will be wrong, but it's a, a bit better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have time for questions. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. But when you talk about bias, you always <coughs> explain that it's the deviation from a certain distribution. And I don't think we know, know most of these distributions. I mean, when you talk about 2% of Twitter users would account for 50% of the content, it may seem strange, but maybe that's, that's how the world is. I mean, 2% of, uh, of the members of the Catholic Church account for 50% of the people going into the church each Sunday. So mm -hmm. I don't think there's much of a difference. So how, how can you have a, an idea about the, the, the hidden basic, the assumed ba basic distribution? In the, in the case of the data study, we, we, were, we wanted to see how bias was distribution, but we don't know the baseline. So basically, I think 2% is the number that happens in practice in Twitter because we had all the data. There is not, more, uh, not too much about bias, it's about wisdom. So we, we believe in this wisdom of the crowd, but if the wisdom comes from 2%, clearly it's not the wisdom of all, our, all of us. And this was the main goal of that work. So I'm worried that 2% of the people is influencing all of us, 
because we are not interacting with the rest. So basically, there are some very influential people in, in Twitter that are forming opinion of many people, and nobody is changing that, especially if the opinion is something that we find wrong. However, going to the meaning of what is right and wrong, that's already a, com a, a complex problem, because in many things, we don't agree. So humanity doesn't agree on many basic things, and that's part of the problem. Maybe we need some uh, uh, alien a spaceship that comes and forces us to agree. And so external, external power, external to the system, and the only way to survive is to agree, to work together. I mean, no nations and no politicians and no army and so on. I'm still an idealistic pe person, so. With the upcoming um, amount of bots on the net, like a lot of uh, content, especially for some languages in uh, Wikipedia, is created by bots, and there are a lot of social bots coming up now. How do you think this is going to affect the bias on the web in the upcoming years or upcoming elections or whatever? So social bots are, are the quality of social bots are as good as the quality of the data they use. So my question will be, are they using the right data? Are they doing the right sampling? Um, so I think it's a, there's some ethical component missing in these systems. Like, for example, the Microsoft example I, I, I mentioned. For example, how we avoid them learning hate speech? I don't think there's an easy solution for that, because it's not about the list of uh, bad words. You can say really bad things with very good words. <laughs> so it's, it's more about language, and it's, language is something hard. So I think that uh, maybe we need uh, multidisciplinary teams, including people that work on ethics, on, on the legal issues, on what is right and what is wrong. So one problem here is that the line that divides free speech from censorship is very thin, and it's very easy to cross to the wrong side. And that's something we need to take care of too. So we talk about uh, awareness about uh, bias, and as most of us are designing algorithms or designing systems that use has this bias inside. So we might also think of debiasing. So I was wondering if thinking about debiasing or trying to debias caused another kind of bias by itself, or causes some kind of authoritism of um, the designer of that algorithm um, into the wisdom of crowd? Yeah, very, very good question. Um, I don't have, I think we need to do research to answer that question. For example, even before the biasing has rela is related to what the, the person here said, many cases we don't know the distribution. In the case of uh, uh, search clicks, we can, with the user data, we can know the distribution, but in many, many cases, we don't know it. So the first thing will be, can we measure what will be the right distribution? Second, can we measure what is the bias with respect to that distribution? So that will be the first two problems before the biasing. I think, uh, I hope, in a statistics, they will work more on these problems, so basically we can measure this. There was a lot of work about 20 years ago, but now we need to come back to these topics because I think they are much more important. With big data, they are much more important than before. It's like we have to do everything again because we never had the amount of data we have today. So a streaming data that coming from, say, all the big internet companies that have more than one billion active users, that's a lot of data. So in one hour, you can know anything. In, in one hour, you can do an A-B a -B testing experiment that will tell you something, but we are not doing enough of that. Partly because exploring and doing this experiment means losing money. Um, so a lot of the biases you mentioned are um, actually, I think, also footed in, uh, grounded in um, sort of uh, societal problems like uh, discrimination, so because as you mentioned with the Wikipedia for instance, so these are sort of social problems which generate these biases which we care about and which are problematic. So should we as a discipline 
uh, work more with social scientists or also talk about more social problems and con consider this side more? Or what, what is your view on this? So this is, the, this is the part of the problem that I said I didn't cover because a lot of people is working on that. But the answer is yes, by, by all means. For, because the social scientists have the right questions. We don't know the questions. We know how to answer the questions, but the question should come from an expert. Now, there's a ca caveat here, and I have seen this in some computer science conference. If you take a social question and you solve it, that's a contribution to sociology, not to computer science. So it depends on what you want to achieve. That would be a problem, because I have seen many computer scientists analyzing data per se, and thinking that that is a contribution to computer science, and for me it's not. If you invent a new technique while analyzing data, that would be a contribution. But the result of the anali analysis usually is for a different field. So that's important depending on your goal. For example, if you are doing your PhD thesis on that, there will be a PhD thesis in sociology, not in computer science. And just a follow-up question, a short one. Um, but, but do you think that it's really that clear with these borders? Because these issues and problems we are talking about, they're sort of caused by the systems we produce or we create. And um, we also give them authority in a sense, in the way we talk about them, in the way we write about them, we advertise for them. So maybe we need to change our thinking and get a more also interdisciplinarity or, or some kind of transdisciplinarity yeah, I completely agree. For example, uh, you, can, you should test all the hypotheses that you put on the system after a while. So does the system perform in the way that we expected? For example, does the system increase or decrease the bias? But most people are not doing th those uh, analysis after. Unless you see something that go goes wrong with, uh, say, revenue or user experience, no one will care about that. For example, every time that you design a website, you are designing an information market. So it's about economy, it's about sociology, and most computer science don't realize that. That even the way you lay out the system will affect the system itself. We think that it's like something separate, but it's a closed system. So the system, the user that uses the system is a closed system, and we're not looking at the whole. We're looking only at the programming. And I think we need to look at the whole. And that's for, for sure is a multidisciplinary thinking. So there's this idea of nudging um, in policy circles. So you, you encourage people to act in a certain way, not in a forceful way, but so pe people tend to go for the sweet, unhealthy foods, so then you put those further away and you put the salad on the first row or something like mm -hmm. that. What do you think about, do you think it would be okay to nudge people towards less, less bias? If we all agree about what is a positive discrimination, uh, yes, I think that's positive. Sometimes you need the right incentives to, to behave better. And there are so many examples about that, so <laughs> yeah, I agree. So, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, this was now the keyword uh, sweet food, but hopefully not unhealthy food. Um, <laughs> as a small gift, uh, we uh, organized uh, a Viennese uh, Sacha cake. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> and, um, Thank you. Bias. Ricardo, uh, thank, you thank you very much for this very interesting talk and please join me saying thank you to our today's skilled speaker. Thank you.